Gentlemen, welcome back to another episode at the Main Corp. Today's topic is going to be around the types of treatment through testosterone optimization therapy. So if you are new here, please consider subscribing. We cover three topics in the channel. That is masculinity, health, and relationships. So again, today's topic is around the different styles, the different methods of treatment for testosterone replacement therapy or testosterone optimization therapy, uh, TRT or TOT for short, whichever, whichever works best for you. You're going to see it both ways. But uh, there's a number of different uh, styles or methods for treatment, and it's, it's good to be aware of what's out there, uh, some research behind it, uh, some potential pitfalls around the use of one or a few different ones, your personal preference. So I thought I would do this to try to bring you some good information about, um, you know, maybe the best style of treatment for you. I'll go over my protocol at the end. Um, I just had my two month checkup yesterday. So uh, I'm fresh off of uh, this week's shots and I, I feel great. But, um, you know, excited to be able to share the different styles and, and methods with you today. And, um, you know, we'll go through these one by one. I'll kind of, you know, describe a little bit about e each one, um, how it works, uh, the, the delivery of it, uh, the placement of it. So there's, there's a bunch of different uh, pieces or components to each one, and, and we'll go over those. So uh, the first one is I wanted to really address is the one that you probably most commonly hear about or see in stores if you go to like uh, Complete Nutrition or if you go to like GNC or, or any of these um, uh, these bigger corporate uh, supplement stores. The natural testosterone boosters that they're pushing in those stores, uh, personally, I've found that they do not work. Um, that's been my experience and a number of the different research research sources that I uh, tapped into, a lot of the uh, sources of people that I you know reached out and spoke with about this, dying or diving into you know different case studies and, and all kinds of different research, um, I found that those just don't they're they're they don't work for a couple of reasons. One, you know they are pricey, uh, they're very expensive. And when I took them, it was a couple years ago, you know, I had to take four big like horse style tablets in the morning and then four at night. That's a lot of tablets. And typically if you're going to buy them, uh, you know, you get, I think like a, you don't really get a 30 day supply, you get like a 15 day supply. So you're doing it twice a month. It's like a $60, um, bottle roughly. So then you're like 120 bucks taking a bunch of pills, uh, that can get really pricey right from the very get go and uh, the results are fleeting. So I'm not gonna say that they, that they don't work entirely, but you can't really tell exactly what's in that little pill or those pills. You know, they're gonna suggest that there's herbals and there's all kinds of other things in there. But you know, because the supplement industry in the North America is, it's, it's unregulated, you know, there's no proof to back up the claims that they actually do raise your testosterone levels or that maybe you know things aren't actually laced in there, or that they're put in there that may not be listed on the label. That freaks me out. Like I'm just not going to ingest or take in things that I don't know where they come from. I don't trust the sources. They haven't been filtered. They haven't been ran through. Um, and it really comes down to the fact that you know those products, um, they're very they're very good marketing companies. So people in the supplement industry have, you know, been very vigilant about, you know, being in front of a very impressionable youth. You know, if I run a fitness channel and, you know, I want to be in front of, you know, 18 to 35 year olds, I'm going to reach out to, you know, fitness influencers on Instagram or um, on YouTube or, or Facebook or wherever. And I'm going to want to promote my product to that audience. So. Uh, you know, regardless if the actual person that's doing the videos, the channel host uh, knows that they work, has tried them, you have to, you can't ignore the fact that they've also been paid a ton of money by that uh, supplement company to um, to promote the product. So I, you know, I, I can't say for sure, but I, I don't know that I have full confidence that they actually use them or that they could testify that they work. There's so much unregulated. There's a lot of unknown. 
Um, you know, it comes down to the fact that they're very good at marketing to an impressionable youth. And we like a quick fix in this country. We like things, you know, to happen quick. We like, you know, the, we like it to get, we like to get it the temperature that we want it, the color, the size, the taste, and we want it yesterday. It's just, you know, that instant gratification. So the supplements that you can buy, I do not agree with. Um, I cannot recommend this as a, an effective way to, to you know, optimize your levels. Plus, again, if you don't know where your blood's at, you're kind of flying in blind. So without a blood test, you're even further, you know, uh, you're even further back than you really where you could be or where you should be. The next one is going to be creams and gels. So there's a couple of key things to note about these. So um, both of them are are a lower concentration. There's, you know, there's, there's ones that have like a higher dose in, uh, in the package or in a little tube that you get. So they're a lower concentration. The problem with those is, is that it's, it's hard to control, uh, the amount that you're getting. So if you disperse it, you know, either on your arm or, you know, on your leg or, or wherever that they recommend that you put it, maybe one week you put on a little too much, Maybe you don't put on enough. Uh, it's hard to really like stay in control and you just can't like start throwing like wacky measurements. It's kind of like baking, like baking. You can't just wing it like you can with cooking. Uh, it has to be, you know, very detailed and it has to be um, monitored. So that way you're getting effective doses and, and you're doing it in accordance to the, the blood labs that you're getting and that you're reviewing on a weekly and a month on a monthly basis, excuse me. So, you know, it, it also relies on its ability to be able to absorb through your skin. So if you have oily skin, if, you know, it comes down to your diet, if you sweat a lot, it, it comes down to like, how good is it absorbing? Some people are going to be better. Some people are not. Some people have more pores that maybe don't open as much as the others. It's just, there's a lot of unknowns and there's a lot of uh, barriers to, to entry. Um, the other big risk with creams and gels is the transfer. So if you put it on, you know, your arm or wherever they tell you to put it, uh, there's a risk that you could actually rub that cream or that gel onto a woman, uh, potentially your spouse or your girlfriend or, or your mom or, or a, a child. And both scenarios are something we want to totally avoid. So if you apply those things, you have to like keep your distance and it's, it's easy to forget that, oh yeah, you know, I just put on that cream or that gel. Um, so transfer is always a big risk with the creams and the gels. Now the creams do work better, especially if, you know, we'll get to injections, but especially if you have like a needle phobia, creams can, can be actually a lot more effective and a lot more cost effective than the gels are. Gels are really expensive. Like, I think if, if you don't get any help from insurance, it's between three and $400 a month. Like that's, I don't know about you guys, but I don't have that kind of like discretionary income to just like throw, you know, three, 400 bucks a, a month at. So um, between the two, the creams actually absorb better uh, through the skin than the gel does. Uh, it has, you know, just a better absorption rate. You get more of the actual true product uh, in the cream. Uh, and you will also avoid needles. But again, back to the application, you know, and, and the distancing thing and the, and the transfer, you have to avoid like swimming, you have to avoid bathing, showering, sweating, um, you know, and you have to do that for like quite a few hours after you apply it. To me, that's, that's gonna be easy to forget and it's just not something that I can like always rely on or maintain. Um, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna forget that, oh, I applied it and I hugged somebody or, um, you know, I, I picked up uh, my niece or my nephew or, I, you know, was horsing around with, uh, you know, one of the, a girl that I know or whatever the case may be. It's just, there's a lot of margin for error and I don't really like that uh, personally, but um, if you have to do one or the other, and you, especially if you have like a thing with needles, the creams is going to be better. Um, and I think that you can apply the creams in areas that don't subject themselves to exposure as easily as like a hug or a high five or, or whatever the case may be. So if you can only go as far as the creams or gels, I recommend the creams. 
um, not the gels. They're just much, much more expensive um, and you get, you get less and there's more of a risk transfer. Um, it's just, you know, between the two, the, the creams is gonna be better. Um, okay, so moving on, the next one is gonna be a nasal gel. So this is gonna be something that, as it states, you're gonna apply uh, within your nose. My board's falling down here. Uh, nasal gel. So not unlike the gels that I was just talking about, uh, there's a lot of side effects that are reported with the gels. So a lot of like really negative ones. And I, I saw like a lot of case studies and a lot of reports where, you know, there was a consistent report of one or a few or all of these side effects. So you could run into headaches, uh, nosebleeds, a cough, sinus infections, sore throats, um, nose pain. I just, um, I don't know that that's where hormones or like a, I don't think it's where it's supposed to go. It seems like it's kind of a sensitive area. So um, that's another one that I really can't recommend. It hasn't been around for too terribly long, but it's just not something that, that, I, would, that I would recommend just because you know, you're gonna apply it. And again, you run into the same thing about transfer. You know, we all kind of touch our face probably too much without even thinking about it. Then you run the risk of transferring it, putting it in your food. It's just, I, I don't know, that's, to me, that's, there's a lot of margin for error there on that one as well. All right, so there's a newer one, uh, and it's uh, it's oral, like an oral tablet, basically. So this is new, and it's still under FDA review. Uh, so the thing that people really like about this is that, you know, if you're used to taking a daily medication, or if you're used to taking like a daily vitamin, a daily, a daily supplement, it's a lot easier to keep people on track with a, uh, an oral tablet. Um, like I said, it is, it is under FDA review right now. So, um, and there's not a ton of data on it. So I think the last thing I saw was in 2019 that it was still under review. So, and going into that, they just don't have a lot of like case studies, a lot of uh, research, a lot of data behind it. So, uh, with that limited data, I can't really recommend it. I'm not going to say that it's off the table. I like the idea of it, the convenience of it. Um, but I just don't know. We'll have to wait until we see what the FDA uh, approves or, or does not with with that uh, with that style again with the oral tablets. So I'm kind of indifferent on that one. You know, it's not the one that that I do, and it's not the one that I know enough about. So it's not really one. I mean, it's it's not really one that I can really suggest uh, today. But moving on. All right. So the next one is a is called a bucol. So the way to think about this is if you've ever seen those, if you know anybody that chews, like chews tobacco, they have those pouches. Well, think of like a really small version of that. What it does is it, it like sticks to your gum and it's, you're supposed to absorb it through, through your gums. So again, it relies on that ability to be able to absorb through the skin. And in the mouth, it doesn't do that, do that well uh, at absorption. So you run into the risk of like, how much am I getting? How much am I not getting? Um, you could run the risk of like actually swallowing it. I don't know if that's great. Um, it getting lost, or if you drank something, you spit something, uh, you could actually spit it out. I don't know that it has any taste, but I just, I don't like the idea of sticking something on my gums um, and letting it, you know, the mouth is like a really intimate place. I just don't, I'm not gonna put any foreign or anything like that in my mouth. Um, the other part is to, you know, it could get dislodged. Like I said, you could run into like sore, like a sore mouth, sore gums, bleeding gums has been reported, uh, toothaches, and you also run another transfer risk. So if you're kissing your girlfriend or your wife, uh, if you're kissing your, your kid, you could run the risk of transfer even there. So, um, you also can't, you also have to avoid like eating or drinking anything for a couple of hours and just like with the creams and gels, it's just that there's a little bit more margin for error and there are easier, more efficient, more effective ways to actually raise or optimize your levels. So for that reason, I cannot recommend the, um, the Bucol. It's not, uh, not something that I would recommend. All right, the next one is pellets. So these are, um, 
these are a little different in that what they do is they they surgically implant these underneath of your skin near your near your like hip area your hip or your waist area so the and it's underneath your skin so it doesn't go like into your muscle it's just it's right underneath the skin so the uh that seems nice in theory you know they have a they have a longer um half-life which we'll get more into when we talk about the injections uh they have a longer half-life so uh i a protocol that like an ideal protocol there is you have to do this like every three to six months. Well, already there in an ideal protocol, there's a variance of three months. So when you inject, let's say that your, your protocol is, is starting off in your first treatment. It's um, your first three months. It's two pellets. Well, what, what happens is there's no way for you to actually control how much you're absorbing or not. Uh, because everybody responds to it differently. Everybody absorbs it, um, takes it in and digests it um, and uh, disperses it in the body differently. I do it differently than you do, than my brother does, than my dad would. I mean, everybody just is a little bit different. So there's really no way to actually control how much you're getting or how much you're not getting. Um, so that, you know, they're slower releasing, but you don't, I mean, that variance of three months you could be in real trouble. You also run the issue of like an infection. If one gets dislodged and let's say that, you know, after you have one that says, okay, this is supposed to last three months. And then after two months, the first two months were great, but that last 30 days is like hell. What, what happens is because you can't like control it, you got a big burst of it and you got a, like basically all the pellets worth in the first two months, that second or that last 30 days, you're gonna experience the real troughs or the real lows because there's nothing there. Um, there's no more to disperse. So your testosterone levels go way low and you know, you're gonna experience all the negative side effects of having, of having low T. So um, because you can't control the concentration, the release of it, um, the fact that it could get dislodged or that even after that two months, I may need to go back in and have more implanted it seems like if we're going to be always chasing that ideal optimum level, if we're, you know, surgically implanting things or needing to take some out, I just, I don't know. I don't like the idea of like foreign material being uh, surgically implanted. Lots of reports of big highs, big lows, not something that I would recommend. I would, you know, pellets are, are not the way to go um, in, in my opinion. The next one is, uh, is patches. So patches, um, let's see here. Okay, so the, the issue with patches is they can be convenient. And again, if you have like a needle phobia or, or a thing with needles, patches could be a way to go for you actually. Um, patches are creams, but the, the issue that was reported and, and I think, you know, a lot of guys, especially if you work out, uh, what they run into is they lose the patch because of sweat. Uh, so excessive sweat. And if you're, you have to wear it for like maybe a few days at a time. So like, I don't know that I'm just going to sit out like a bunch of workouts so that I can avoid sweating so that my patch doesn't fall off. To me, that's not very convenient. Um, so there's also the issue of like skin irritation because it sits on the skin for a couple days. Uh, then it can be, you know, irritate your skin. Also, if you have a lot of body hair, um, you know, you're going to have to like continuously shave that area or shave different areas, move it around. So that way you don't get the skin irritation. So you're going to have to like shave different areas. I, I don't know. Um, it could be a good option, but patches, I just, I can't recommend it. It's not something that, that um, would be convenient. You know, if you work out a lot, you're going to run into issues with slipping off, falling off sticking to your hair or needing to shave. Not, uh, not cool in my book, not convenient. So the, uh, now we're going to get into the injection side of it. So injections are, um, the way to go in my opinion. Now that's if you don't have like any kind of issues with needles, you can handle it. Um, and it's something that, uh, you can either have administered to you 
or you can do yourself. So right now, because we're trying to figure out what the optimum weekly level dosage for me is, so we're still testing that, uh, even after two months, um, the idea is to start low and then go slow. There's nothing, there's no rush on this, uh, but you're gonna continue to tweak and refine things. Uh, but we're still trying to dial in what that optimum dosage is for me, even after two months. So um, what, uh, what the injections do is they're, they're injected intramuscularly. So they go into the muscle. There's a bit of a pinch, not gonna lie. Um, but the way, that they, the way that they design these, because there are four different types of injectable testosterone. Um, you have undecanate, you have pro, propionate. I'm gonna butcher these, I'm sure I'm getting these wrong. So undecanoate, propionate, and then the last two are cipionate and endionate. So I know that I'm butchering those, but it's just think that if you want like an easier way, there's a U, a P, a C, and an E. So the first two we'll go over are the U and the, and the P. Um, and the way that they look at these injections, which to do like what's an optimum protocol, what they do is they look at the, the half-life, meaning how long uh, after it's injected is it most effective? Do you feel the results? Uh, is it something that can be found in your bloodstream or your urine? Um, the half-life is, is really, you know, how long it's, it's really, you know, effective after, after it's injected. So the one with the U, the undecanoate, and I know I'm butchering these, um, that has a longer half-life. So, um, meaning after it's injected, it lasts a lot longer. So a protocol using the one with the U is every 10 to 14 days. So the issue, the only issue with that you know, you have a reduced amount of shots if you're doing the shots. I mean, that's the only way to get it, but you have a reduced amount of shots, but if you go through it really fast, like if you get like 100 milligrams uh, injected and then you, you have to wait another 10 to 14 days, you could have ran through almost all of that or all of that by the time you even got to day six or seven. So those last seven or eight days before you get to your next shot, you're in a really low period, low mood, um, low libido, low motivation, uh, more depressed, more down in the in the dumps. I'm not feeling your best, not feeling uh, sharp mentally. So there's a lot of reports of like highs and lows, and um, you know I I don't know that that that's not what I'm in it for. You know I want to you know, the idea here is to kind of tweak and refine it and to kind of keep things optimum at all times. So with the volatility of like the up and down on the the undecanate or the U one, <laughs> um, not one that I would recommend. Um, the U, I'm just gonna, I'll put the, I'll put the actual names in the, uh, of what they are in the show notes below because I know that I'm not doing these a service. Um, so the next one is uh, propionate. And this is the one that's with a P. So propionate is actually the most, it's the strongest. So if you inject 100 milligrams, you actually get, I think they say on average, you get about 83% of that 100 or 83 milligrams or, or whatever, however you wanna uh, slice it. So it's the strongest, but it has the shortest half-life. So the half-life on propionate is 1.75 to 2.5 days. So I just had my shot less than 24 hours ago, um, yesterday afternoon at like two. So that would mean that you know, through the weekend that I would be experiencing, you know, the, um, all the effects. But by the time I got to like probably Monday morning, maybe even Sunday night, I'm going to start to taper off and I don't get my shots again until Thursday. So it would be real high, but then you get lows, uh, throughout before you get back into your next shot. So it's the strongest, it's the one that absorbs quickly. Um, but it's not depending on your, uh, what your, what your protocol is, Right now, when we're testing mine to figure out what uh, the proper dose is, I have to go in and get shots on a weekly basis. I'll get into how that's a little bit different in, in what I'll do um, once we decide, or once he decides what um, that optimum level is, that dosage is. Um, but 
that's what they look at. They look at the half-life and they look at, you know, um, if we can reduce the amount of shots, they always, they're always going to try, try and do that uh, if they can. But um, anyway, so the, that's the, the, the propionate. Now, because I can only get in there every seven days when we're testing it out, uh, after two and a half days, that, I, that's still another couple of days I'm going to feel like crap. Or not feel my best, not be sharp, not have you know have the energy, not have the zest, um, all the benefits. So I don't want to do you know potentially three shots a week, or three or four shots a week. You know if I burn through it really quick, that means I'm having to inject it a lot. That's a lot of monitoring. Um, that's a lot of needles. That's just I, you know I'm not interested in, in doing that. So um, with that one, the propionate, not one that I would recommend. And it's actually when well, you go see an endocrinologist. They're going to know all these types, and they're going to be able to, um, to, you know, specify and go through the same detail, probably in better fashion than I'm here, but um, to make it a little bit more clear. So the last two are cipionate and enanthanate. <laughs> I know I'm killing those. Okay, so now cipionate is the one that I take. Yeah, um, that's the one that they use at the clinic that I go to. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's injected intramuscularly and it's every seven days. So a protocol like the optimum protocol, if you're going to do this, you know, we've covered the natural stuff. We've covered creams and gels and, you know, topicals and, you know, stuff you put in your mouth and stuff you, um, put in your nose. If you're looking for the optimum, most effective way that's recommended through case studies, through research. If you talk to your endocrinologist, if you talk to people who actually understand hormones, uh, understand testosterone specifically, uh, what to look for on your blood markers, the optimum most recommended protocol is to have between 200 and 250 milligrams injected every seven days. So right now, my protocol is to have um, 200 milligrams of cipionate every seven days. So, um, cipion, and it's worked, it's worked well so far. So again, they look at the half-life. Now, cipionate and enanthanate compared to propionate, propionate had a one, uh, one and a half to two and a half day uh, half-life. So a quick burst, but it's short-lived. Now, on cipionate and enanthanate, the, the shelf life is between two and three and a half days. So you extend it a little bit longer. So that's why it's the recommended protocol because you get, it's more uh, sustained for a little bit longer. So again, you're reducing the amount of shots that you have to take. Um, it lasts a little bit longer and um, you don't experience like highs and lows. It's more steady state. So that's gonna be the recommended protocol. Again, 200 to 250 milligrams injected every seven days um, of cipionate or enanthanate. Now, the last thing that I'll say is when, once we do establish my, uh, my most optimum level. So let's say that once I have my next lab done, which I think is in two or three weeks, uh, once I have my next lab done, if, if it's, if it's reported or if my labs show that I'm in that uh, optimum range for my age, which is between 900 and 1200, then we're going to know that, that 200 every seven days is my optimum, um, weekly dosage. So once we've established that, uh, what I've chosen to do is from that point going forward is they're gonna drop ship me all the stuff and they're gonna send it to my house so that I can administer it myself. It's a little bit cheaper that way. I don't have a problem with needles. I'm happy to, to, you know, to do it myself, um, keep it clean and, and to make sure that it's done right. But because of the shelf, because of the half-life, um, if I know that it is 200, what I intend to do, and I've been very transparent with them about this, and it's something that they hear a lot and they actually recommend, is to take that 200, if that's the number, take that 200 and then split it in two different doses. So if you have a, you know, two and a half to, or um, what was it? It was two to three and a half day um, uh, half-life. That means that if I do it on, you know, Monday, I'm good through Wednesday, and then I do another one on Thursday, I'm good through Sunday, I'm doing another one on Monday. That way I'm always kind of like leveling out and keeping optimum levels. And when I asked him about that, because I had read about it in a lot of the research, 
they said that a lot of the guys that do the drop shipping will actually do that. They don't rec they they don't first recommend that because again you're telling your patient there that you know you're gonna have to do another shot and one may be plenty for some people. I'm cool with it, it's fine, I don't have a problem with it, but you know my goal is to is to stay steady state and to be optimum as often as possible. So as a result of doing that, uh, we'll, we'll split my dose in half. If it's 200, 100 on Monday, 100 on Thursday, that way I'm kind of keeping all regulated. So the Cypionate and the Enanthanate is the recommended protocol. Now you still have the option to be able to go into um, to your clinic um, if you want. If you want to drop ship it to yourself or have somebody, maybe your your buddy or you know your wife or your girlfriend, if you want to have them give you the shots, you can do that too. It's a little bit cheaper that way, um, especially if you don't have an issue with needles. But um, that's th that's the that's the rundown. Those are the types of different treatments. Um, some old, some convenient, some not so, uh, some ones that are maybe a little bit more comfortable for you. But uh, hope, hopefully that gives you a little bit of a, I don't know, a barometer for what method might work best for you. Um, again, I do the, uh, the once every seven days and I'll move to once every about three or four days. And I just had my shots yesterday. I'm feeling great. This will last me through the weekend because uh, I get them on Thursday. So this will last me through the weekend. Um, and I'm usually good until about Monday. And then by Tuesday, Wednesday, and then on Thursdays when I get my shots, I know that I'm ready and um, I need to get back in there for shots. So um, once we establish what that level is, I'll, you know, I can, I'll let you guys know, but I intend to split it up so that way we're always keeping, the goal is to, is to always remain at that steady state, keeping optimum levels, not too low, not too high, just steady state. So hopefully you found this helpful. Um, if you have any questions or if you uh, are curious to hear anything else about methods or treatment for uh, testosterone, definitely drop me a line or drop me an email, uh, comment below. My email is themancoreproject at gmail.com. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate you guys watching. Um, have a great day. Uh, be well, and I will see you soon on another video. Take care.